So when we used to pass the baskets, it made it smoother to, to make this transition. So this is a little bit awkward, but hey, it's me. It's all good. Well, this week was something really dramatic for our, uh, for our uh, family. And that is um, Sarah and Sean's oldest, my oldest granddaughter, uh, this morning is at Liberty University. She was dropped off the other day. Here's a picture of us on our goodbye dinner that we had the other night before she left the next morning for uh, Liberty University. And so we'll probably not see her. Well, I'm pretty sure we won't see her until Christmas time. And uh, Ben is there. Dylan, Antoine is there. Is there anyone else from our church? I think that's it. But, um, uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. But one of the things that I can tell you about my oldest granddaughter is that she is awesome. That's something that you would say. She loves the Lord with all her heart. I, it's going to be amazing what God does through her in the days ahead. And what an amazing, amazing blessing she is to us and to our family. And how incredibly proud I am of her. And uh, just, she's awesome. She's awesome. Awesome. That's, we use that word a lot, don't we? We use that word all the time if you think about it, the word awesome. Matter of fact, you might have told somewhere, somewhere along the way, that pizza was awesome, right? Do we use it? You know what? Using the word awesome as much as we do in our culture reminds me of, it reminds me of Vincini in uh, Princess Bride when he kept using the word inconceivable. You remember? And Inigo told him, um, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And I think that's exactly what happens when we use the word awesome. The word awesome by definition, here's a great definition for awesome. It's captivating amazement at the wondrous authority and mysterious presence of God. Let that resonate for a minute. Now that is awesome. And so this morning as we get our attention off of the struggles and issues over these next several weeks as we're starting this new series we're calling who is god and the purpose of that is that each one of us so i'm talking about starting with me and each of you wherever you are in your relationship with god that at the end of this message series you will be able to honestly say i feel closer i am more connected to god I know God better because of the concepts that I got my head around as we just focused on who God is. Now here's the temptation, is to turn this into a theology class. So one of the things that we're going to work very hard in not doing, by the way, every time you're interacting with the Word of God, you're dealing with theology. You follow? But I'm saying I don't want this to be a formal kind of scholastic kind of thing. I want it to be something that truly is devotional in drawing us into a more intimate connection with God. And in order to do that, we're going to have to approach it a different way. So although we will be dealing with things like God is omniscient and omnipotent and he is immutable and uh, he is all loving and he is completely holy and with, although we'll be dealing with that we're not just going to give you a list of the attributes of God I don't believe that will accomplish what we want to accomplish we want to dig into knowing God more intimately and our thought is this I know I need this our thought is that if we will focus on who God is all the things of earth will grow strangely dim as the old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, tells us. And so I want that to happen. You see, sometimes we're a little bit like a friend that I had years ago. He had a little toddler. She was probably about 18 months old. And they were playing out in the backyard, and the grass was a little bit high. And he had a ball. And he would roll the ball, and she would giggle and laugh and love it. And she would toddle over to the ball and pick it up and bring it back to him. And he'd roll it a little bit farther, and she would laugh and go get it and bring it back to him and she did that over and over again until finally he rolled it out there a pretty good distance and she took a couple of steps and she stopped and looked back at him 
And he said, go on, go on, it's there. And she took a couple more steps and stopped and looked back at him. And the dad said, go on, it's right out there. He could see it so clearly. And then he realized what had happened. From her little vantage point, the grass was hiding the ball and she didn't know it was there. And so the only way she was directed to the ball is she kept looking back at dad who could see clearly and directing her to the ball. Y'all getting this or do I have to explain it? <laughs> see, that is what I want us to do is just look back at the father, keep our eyes on him and know that he will direct us where we need to go. You know, we think our problems are so big, don't we? They are kind of overwhelming. And by the way, this is a challenge level that I've not experienced in my life before. This is new to me and I'm pretty old. We get so overwhelmed with our issues and our problems, our concerns, our circumstances with this pandemic, with wash your hands. I'm driving down the road and they're putting it up on the road signs, wash your hands and social distance. Like, can I just drive to the store without being reminded once? It's just everywhere and you just, you can't get away from it. It's just constant. And we get overwhelmed by that. But what if there's another way to think? What if there's an antidote we can take every time we're beginning to get overwhelmed by our circumstances? Would that be helpful? Is that something that could be a blessing to us this morning? Well, let's pray. Father, you are a great and awesome God. We ask you this morning to open our eyes that we might be able to see you as you truly are. We invite you to show up in a big way and change our hearts because we come to you in the name of your son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's just get started with the beginning. All right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know what I think is one of the most peculiar words we use in our culture is prehistoric times. Do you realize how often they're saying prehistoric? Prehistoric times. Now, now some of you just kind of went, wow, prehistoric. That is, that means the time before history was recorded, right? But I have something recorded that says in the beginning. And by the way, it says, in the beginning, God. When the beginning began, God was already there. Do you realize the Bible does not argue for the existence of God? The Bible presumes it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says the earth. The earth. Here's our picture. I think this is from Apollo 17, actually. I think I have the right number. Earth, third rock from the sun. You all remember third rock? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be old to remember that sitcom, maybe. This little ball of dirt is flying through Earth at 66,700 miles an hour. Do you realize that's how fast we're moving right now? It's tilted at 23 and a half degrees, which creates our seasons. And all 7.8 billion people on planet Earth could stand on Rhode Island with room left over. Now look at this. This is a map of Rhode Island, and that's just the U.S. They have to blow it up for you to see it. Then God said, let there be light. And boom, there was light. Think of it. The universe is one of God's thoughts. He thought and spoke it into existence. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? We're told in Psalm 104 that God wraps himself in light as with a garment. This morning, I walked to my closet and I had to pick this out. Some of you are saying, why? <laughs> All right, you have so many options. That's it. So I, I had to pick this out. God gets up in the morning and he puts light on himself. That is such a profound thought 
that something we can't get our head around in our world today is that in the future, when there is a new heaven and new earth, our Lord himself will be the source of light. There will be no sun or moon or stars, but the Lord himself will be the light that lights the eternal city. I want you to catch that idea. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made but it was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not extinguish it. Amen? In the darkness we're living in, that light, God wraps Himself in light. What an incredible thing. Let's talk about light. Light is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. I remember the other day they were saying about pit stops at the Indianapolis 500 today and that for every second they wait, what are they doing? Like three football fields, something like that. I don't remember exactly what the number is, but they're traveling like for every second that, you, that your pit stop takes extra the other cars are traveling like three football fields. And by the way, every second, God has light traveling 186,000 miles. Do you understand it? that light could run the entire 500 in a millisecond? And it's already done. Think about that. That's what God has created. 186,000 miles per second. That's 11 million miles per Per minute. That's 670 million miles per hour. Compare that to, by the way, that the escape velocity from, the US, from uh, Earth's gravity is 25,000 miles an hour. And this is 670 million miles an hour. That's 5.88 trillion miles a year. And scientists, astronomers, uh, astronomers, Astrophysicists use 5.88 trillion miles a light year, how far light travels in a year, to measure the heavens. God just uses the span of his hand. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the howl of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Light year, light year, light year, light year. That's how God measures things. Incredible. Our ne nearest um, astronomical body is the moon, 238,712 miles away from us. That, by the way, ranges based upon when it's closer and farther away. And it takes light 1.255 seconds to reach us from the moon. The moon, gravity of the moon, creates the tides and the tides cleanse the oceans. Twelve people have walked on that. They're talking right now about a new expedition to the moon. I'm looking forward to it. I remember 50 years ago last year when they walked on the moon for the first time. Well, today, this message that I'm, I'm sharing with you is available, much of it is available from uh, Louis Giglio. Some of you have heard his uh, series, Indescribable. Have you ever seen this? It's a two-part DVD, Indescribable. If you have not seen this, find it wherever you do and watch it. He is incredible. Uh, Louis Giglio is pastor of Passion City Church in Atlanta uh, and uh, just uh, does an amazing job. And I want us to, I'm going to use a lot of the stuff he does, a lot of the images that he used in here. So I'm giving him full credit. Uh, we're going to take it a little different direction, but I want us to get it this morning. Our solar system is with our solar, our star, the sun. The sun is 93 million miles away. 
That means from the instant light leaves the surface of the sun, it takes eight and a half minutes to reach us. Think about that. It's burning at 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has enough fuel to burn for the next four billion years. Oh Lord, please don't delay coming back that long. <laughs> the sun is so powerful that solar episodes can knock out radio communications on earth. Now listen to this in Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. A little farther down, Isaiah 40, verse 25. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls each of them by name. We don't know the names of the stars. We haven't even begun to make up names for the stars. There's few. But we don't know them, do we? Like God does. What an incredible thought. Sometimes we think we're so big and important and our world is so significant and we are so important and, or we think our nation is so important and we, we get kind of overwhelmed with our own bigness. You ever been there? By the way, if you don't think you're ever there, you gotta ask people that love you lots if they'll tell you the truth. Voyager, the spacecraft that was sent out in 1977, and it looped through our solar system and on its path way, way out into the beyond. And in 1990, right before it left our solar system, they asked it to turn around and take a picture of planet Earth. Here's the picture. You see it? Let me help you. <laughs> Carl Sagan named that the pale blue dot. When we look at that picture, we realize God is really, really big. And we are really, really small. We see the stars of the universe and think it's all about us. You see, the fall, my sin, makes me think I'm a whole lot more important than I actually am. But the universe is all about declaring the awesome character of God. Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says this, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. When you look up into the night sky, do you think of God? Or do you think of our telescopes? And the names we have given to the constellations. And thinking about that we've sent spaceships up into there. Or do we look at the stars and think of God? How big does the universe have to be to declare God's glory? Well, let's take a tour. We live in the Milky Way. That's our galaxy, our subdivision, if you will. Our nearest star, I think there's a picture there, that's a, it's a spiral galaxy, as you know. And uh, we live out on the fringes of it somewhere. Our sun is somewhere out in one of those arms. And God made sure 
that our sun is just far enough away from the earth and far enough from the center of the galaxy so that we can actually have the life he intended to have on this planet. Our nearest star is Alpha Centauri. We have to go out 4.3 light years. That means if you look tonight and you're able to see Alpha Centauri, that light left Alpha Centauri that you're seeing tonight on May 6th, 2016. Kind of an incredible thought, isn't it? You see, people through the years, through the centuries, through the millennia, have worshipped stars when their purpose is to glorify God. We read in Deuteronomy 4.19, And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. Kind of reminds me of the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. You remember Calvin and Hobbes? He hasn't been in the cartoons for a long time. He, he uh, retired. But, uh, oh, Calvin, just a... Uh, crazy little boy, just a, a uh, and thoughtful, but got into a lot of trouble. And he had his friend, which was a stuffed tiger by the name of Hobbes. And Calvin one day says, do you believe our destinies are determined by the stars? And Hobbes says, nah. Calvin says, oh, I do. Hobbes says, really, how come? Calvin says, life's a lot more fun when you're not responsible for your actions. <laughs> if my horoscope is determining what today's going to be like, then I don't have to be responsible for me. Kind of a cool thought, right? Kind of a messed up thought. Well, let's go out 440 light years to Pleiades. And did you know that's in the scripture? Job 38, 31 says, can you direct the movement of the stars, binding the cluster of the Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion? That's actually Orion, Pleiades right there that you're looking at. Well, let's go out 600 light years. And there is a star by the name of uh, Betelgeuse, I think is how it's said. I'm not sure of that. Betelgeuse. I don't know, maybe it's filled with um, ghosts, I don't know. But it's 600 light years out. It is 1,000 times bigger than our sun. Now get a picture of that. You've probably never even seen it. But since the beginning of time, it has been declaring the glory of God. Glory of God. 400 light years farther, a thousand light years out, there's Vela Pulsar. And a pulsar is a star that explodes on itself and it creates a vibration, if you will. And they've actually recorded the sound of this exploding and on itself and vibrating 11 times a second. And it sounds kind of like this. And it's doing that. And think about that. They had to use a radio telescope to hear that. And all of a sudden they perceived it and they heard it and they're going, wow, that's crazy. And yet since the beginning of the earth, that pulsar has been declaring the glory of God 11 times a second, day and night declaring the glory of God. Kind of makes you think like Jesus said about the rocks. When some of the religious leaders told Jesus to quiet down the crowd on what we call Palm Sunday as he came down into Jerusalem on the donkey and the crowds were cheering and saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said, if I tell them to be quiet, the rocks themselves will cry out. I don't know about you, but I don't want a pulsar star a thousand light years away 
to outsing me when I worship the Lord. Go out 2,000 light years and there's ring nebula. Look at these pictures. <laughs> Something we can't quite get our head around. The ring is one light year across. In other words, 5.88 trillion miles across. And then we look at the superstar of the Milky Way galaxy, Eta Carina. It's about 8,500 light years away. Now listen to this. I want you to get your head around this just a little bit. It is the superstar in the galaxy. It is the brightest, incredible star. It's five million times brighter than the sun. They estimate its heat at hundreds of millions of degrees. That would take quite a thermometer, wouldn't it? You had us out there saying, look at me. It's putting off gas. Wait a minute, did I miss one? Oh, I did. <laughs> Sorry. That is the hourglass nebula, and that they call that the eye of God. Isn't that amazing that a picture would come back like that? I understand that's just a photographic thing, but do you understand that God knew that one day they were going to take a picture of that through the Hubble telescope? And when we saw it in full color, it's going to take our breath away as we see the eye of God. That's called the Hourglass Nebula. The next one here is Eta Carina. Right there. It's kind of, you can see the gas coming off of that. Think about that the center of that star is five million times brighter than the sun. All right, so let's leave our neighborhood and let's go to the nearest galaxy. And 200,000 light years away is the small Magellan, um, Magellanic cloud, small Magellanic cloud. It's an incubator of new stars, and each of the 50 stars in this cloud that it's creating are 300,000 times brighter than our sun. Think about that. Then 28 million light years away, they got the picture of this sombrero galaxy. Look at that. It's just the perfect angle so that the vantage point put it on the side so you can see the ring and see around it how incredible is that what do you think you think there are people out there are there other planets and other people does the Bible say there aren't anybody else in the universe or is that just our own Self-interest. By the way, there are angels God created. Right? I don't know. I don't know. You know what? The Bible says this. It says, the, the things concealed belong to the Lord. But the things revealed belong to us and to our people. Does that make sense? So God didn't tell us everything. You can think up questions that the Bible doesn't address. Oh, yeah, God says, you don't need to know that. I reveal what you need to know so that you could know me. And that's the issue. Not so that you can know everything, but so that you and I can know him. And that's what he's revealed. What do you think is the purpose of creating all this? The, the 28 million light years away. And there it is. On the side, we get a picture of it. Looks like God's playing Frisbee. Why did God go to all the bother to create all those galaxies if we're the only one intelligent life in it? I say intelligent, I should do air quotes, right? Why would he bother? You know what God would say? What bother? Why do you think that's a bother? 
Romans 1.20 says this, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. If you don't know the Lord, you have no excuse. I didn't say that. God said that. Because God says, oh, I have made myself known. And yet, what do we do? People have a tendency to suppress the truth and begin to think up foolish ideas of what God is like. And we kind of make God in the image of man and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. God says, I have made myself known, being understood by what is made. You know, you think about God creating all this and all this space and all that he did. And, and like that sombrero galaxy that we looked at a minute ago. And you look at that and say, that's just cool. I mean, like, like that he did that is just cool. It's like artistic. Imagine you had never seen anything like that and an artist painted it and you would go, wow, that is a really cool image, isn't it? And yet God did that in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. And do you know what the scriptures say? Well, let me give you an illustration. This is kind of uh, going down memory lane a little bit here, but my uh, Granddaughter Haley that I was talking about earlier, when she was just a little thing, did a finger paint of the sun and a flower and wrote from Haley to Mimi on the bottom of it. She was probably, I don't know, five years old, four years old when she did this. That's her finger paint. How many of you remember finger painting when you were a kid? Yeah. How many of your kids finger paint, right? It's easy, safe, messy. All the things kids love is messy. Pretty awesome. Do you know that all of these stars and galaxies we've been looking at are God's finger paint? Psalm 8, 3 and 4 says, when I look at the night sky, and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. King David had only one response to that. What are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? See, David got it. God, you are awesome. And we aren't even dust. Why would you take the time? If you can create a galaxy 28 million light years away, why would you have any time, any concern, even a thought toward me? And yet you do, Lord. That is overwhelming. Who am I that you would even know me? By the way, do you think there's something healthy in that question? Who am I that you would even know me? In light of what God has made and who he is. 30 million light years away is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's called a Grand Design Galaxy. Early on, astrophysicists thought that the tail is eating up this other galaxy. That's another galaxy, by the way, over there on the tail. And then they realized, no, no, no. That's way beyond this galaxy. Spiral galaxy. Incredible picture. Look at that. Isn't that something? Just happened to catch it because of the angle of the telescope. Caught it flat. There's some bar barrows tilted. This one's flat so we can see it. It has two arms. Can you see them? 
looks like more, but if you actually follow it to the middle, you see there are two arms off of that. They took the Hubble and they said, let's, let's zero in to the very center of that galaxy. And here's the image that came back. They call it the X feature. Louis Giglio says, and I agree, it just looks like the cross. That's what it brings to my mind. Don't be fooled, by the way. Each beam of the cross is 600 trillion miles across. Do you understand the space, the size? We can't get our head around. You see, that picture reminds me of this picture. I've shared this with you before, but this is a thought that I can never get over. That when God created the galaxies, the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets, Earth. He was playing, if you will. Did a kid doing finger paint playing? I mean, he's using his fingers, going bling, bling, bling. I, I mean, you, you leave. It's it's a human accommodation to even say he was using his fingers. You with me? I mean, he just thought the thought and said the word, and it happened. All I'm saying is, he's just thinking, what about this? What about that? What about when, in the late 20th century, humans finally build a telescope that can see the center of the whirlpool galaxy and they zero in on it? Yeah, the scientists will say it's an X, but my people will know that from the creation of the universe, I have been holding out my arms to bring you to myself. All creation finger painting. Playing with his fingers, if you will. Just creating because it's fun. Oh, why bother? Remember again, what bother? It's like asking an artist, why do you bother painting pictures? What bother? <laughs> it, it flows from inside of who I am. And that's what God has been doing. And yet when it was time to redeem you and me, listen to what the scripture said he had to do. Isaiah 50 verse 10. God has rolled up his sleeves all the nations can see his holy muscled arm. Everyone from one end of the earth to the other sees him at work doing his salvation work. The scriptures tell me that when God made the sombrero galaxy, he just went fingers. But when God determined to redeem you and me, he rolled up his sleeves and made bare his holy arm. He had to get down in the dirt and break a sweat to redeem us from our sin. Now that is awesome. So what? How big are your problems? In light of God's awesomeness, what will you do specifically when you face 
a challenge this week. I'm going to ask you to take an action step here. I'm going to ask you this week, as a matter of practice, when it's clear, it's supposed to be clear most of the week, that you step outside every night for a moment or two and look up in the sky and allow the heavens to declare the glory of God. You see, if the universe was for us to live in, then it is a massive waste of space. But if the purpose of the universe is to display the glory of God, it couldn't be big enough. Let's pray. Father God, you are awesome. You have painted the stars on the canvas of space. The universe is there crying out to us, declaring your beauty, your power, your majesty. We know you are awesome. And we are so small. And yet you care about every detail of our lives. Lord, may the vastness of your universe remind us that no problem we will ever face is too big for you to handle. May the stars be a reminder that you have everything in control. Help us to see our challenges, our worries, our problems, in light of the fact that you are awesome. We ask this, we come to you, we approach your throne of glory through your son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now listen, I don't want to end without giving maybe someone here the opportunity to respond to our awesome God. And maybe today is the day where you'll quit resisting and pushing away and, res and just have a moment of surrender. Just say, God, I don't know what I'm resisting you for. I believe you are awesome. I believe you sent your son to die on the cross and raise from the dead to pay for my sin debt. And right now, I want to connect with you. I ask you to forgive my sin, Lord. I'll turn from my sin and ask you to come into my life and take control. Maybe you need to pray that right now. If you will, I promise that our awesome God will make his home in your heart as you learn to trust in him. Those of us who know him, did I just speak the truth? Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, y'all have a great week. I love you guys. Be safe. Keep looking up. And God is awesome.